So um, I'm going to just run through the from the theory into the practice and what my experiences were of, um, of taking HIV medication uh, and uh, in the first instance not taking HIV medication. Um, I was diagnosed in 1991 in my final year of college at the age of 23. Um, and at that time, the Concord uh, study was taking place for AZT. Um, and I was recommended at that first appointment when I was diagnosed to consider when I came back starting on the Concord trial, uh, as it was the one option that was there and that was available. Um, I went away and read up what I could and talked to people that I could meet that were living with HIV and taking AZT. Um, and uh, what I heard and what I read, I didn't like, and so I made a decision that I wasn't going to take uh, AZT. Um, and um, really, the, the tolerability of the drug and the, the, the dosage of the drug was such that I just didn't think it was the right option for me, given the fact that I knew that um, the infection had been within the last year, and potentially I had another maybe five or six years of health before things got went badly wrong, and so I waited. Um, and I continued to wait as new um, uh, drugs became available. My doctor um, at the Baltimore Market encouraged me to, to look at what was happening, to talk with me, what was available. Um, and I listened and I, I read up what I could. Um, it was pre-internet, so I relied on newsletters from the US and, um, and what I could find um, within the UK in terms of conversations. But I made a decision really that as I wanted to look after myself and I took the, the first do no harm approach in terms of looking at complementary and alternative therapies um, while waiting until uh, the science around HIV medicine um, got to the point where it was um, going to be manageable. Uh, that included waiting um, long enough that I was diagnosed with AIDS. Um, and so in 1995, I got my AIDS diagnosis when I developed first um, cutaneous uh, Kaposi sarcoma and then pulmonary Kaposi sarcoma. So my doc to my doctor's great surprise, while I was still refusing ARVs, I did accept chemotherapy. And it didn't make sense to him, but, but to my mind, there was still not the perfection around the HIV treatment, but I knew that chemo would work for the cancer. Um, and so I started uh, on chemo. Uh, the first uh, round was, wasn't particularly successful, but then at that point I was lucky enough that they were developing the liposomal doxorubicin, uh, and that actually managed to uh, manage the KS and, and, and allow me to continue to work. Um, having said that, it was, it was problematic that year, and uh, I was hospitalized several times in 1996 um, uh, and went uh, into medical retirement at that point with an expectation that I was probably going to die within the next six months. However, what was also happening, as Paul talked about, was that in 96, the Vancouver conference demonstrated that the ARVs uh, in combination were working effectively. Um, and I still held out a little bit. I have to say I'd been, I'd been so resistant for so long and so uh, caught up in thinking of what I could do for myself that I waited. And when my doctor said, look, we can start, you know, in combination therapy, I said, you know, I, I just need to see people get better. I want, the, I want to see the evidence with my own eyes. Uh, and at the end of 96 and beginning of 97, I literally saw friends come out to hospital who weren't expected to get out of, uh, of hospital. Um, you know, that Lazarus effect of people literally getting out of their deathbeds and then being fit and well very, very quickly. And it was, uh, it was that that then drove me to decide to start ARVs in 97. Um, and really, I had a phenomenal boost of energy. That was my main side effect of medication. Um, I didn't have any problems with taking it, despite the fact that the combination that I was on um, was, uh, was difficult to take. Uh, it was an unboosted protease inhibitor, which means, needed to be, meant that it needed to be taken three times a day on an empty stomach. Um, so I had a, a dose at uh, 8, 4 uh, and 12 um, through the day with the three hour uh, not being able to eat around that time. And then my other meds were taken with food and then there was all the complementary therapies. Uh, and so it was quite a complex and difficult regime to manage um, and not really helped by the fact that I also then developed reconstitution uh, syndrome when my immune system rebooted, uh, putting me in hospital with uh, pneumonia. Um, Having said that, I managed the drugs um, and lived very well for the next couple of years, uh, managing those treatment times throughout the days, looking after my health. I wasn't at work and so my, my health was my full-time job at that point. Um, unfortunately, what we then found out with, with two of the three drugs that I was on was that uh, some of the side effects were lipoatrophy. So some people had lipodystrophy where the, the body fat was redistributed in 
weird and not so wonderful places. I just did the lip atrophy, which meant that my face, uh, my limbs, my chest, my behind, I lost all of the body fat. Uh, and it just disappeared over a period of those two years. So that by the time it got to 1999, I looked more typically um, that image of somebody dying of AIDS than I did in 97 when I started treatment. Um, and so the psychological difficulties of managing that were really challenging at that point, especially since it was a time when I was considering going back to work. Um, so that was my first switch. Um, we, we switched uh, in Dinevir. Uh, and we switched the, the, the Stavidine um, because they were clearly associated and I, I switched then from those three times a day for the Indinavir to a, a single dose of the Fabrins um, uh, and the Stavidine was switched to the Vacavir. So I went from taking tablets five times a day down to twice a day um, by, by 2000. Um, Unfortunately, fibrins also caused me side effects over the over the long term, um, uh, and basically, because I was about to go back to work, I wasn't able to function with the fibrins because the psychological effects, um, the neuropsychiatric difficulties that that it caused, the the dreams and nightmares, and the fact of the fatigue as a result of it meant that I needed to switch again, um, and so in in two thousand I switched to novirapine, uh, and really. If it weren't for drug interactions, I would still be on that. Well, I still am I'm on that combination today, but I've had to switch in between. Um, in 2008, um, I had a hep C diagnosis um, and uh, did treatment for hepatitis C, but um, I had to switch uh, my treatment because of the fact that some of the drugs that I was using weren't going to work with that. So it was a case of then thinking about drug drug interactions um, and the uh, Kivexa combination switched over to Truvada. Um, uh, and then I completed the, the hep C treatment and continued with that drug combination for a while until again some long-term side effects seemed to be the case and I noticed um, problems I had teeth just snapping off uh, which seemed a bit strange um, uh, and we couldn't work out what it might have been I went and had a bone density test and was diagnosed with osteopenia and so we switched from Truvada which is associated with uh, um, uh, bone density issues and switched back to Kivexa um, the only other switches that I've had since then um, has been the, the effect of having generics. And so I'm now a very, very cheap patient uh, to treat um, from, from, you know, sort of uh, however much it would have been, I don't know if it, you know, sort of 10, 12,000 pounds back, back in the early days down to um, less than a thousand pounds a year now in relation to what I'm on with my generic treatment. Um, it works very well. I'm on an old combination. But it works perfectly well for me, so I don't. I go along with the with that idea of everything broke, don't fix it. Um, having said that, where we'll go and what will be available may may change my mind on that one. Yeah, I'm, I will, I remain open to persuasion. Um, the only other significance then in relation to me now being 50 plus and living with HIV um, is that I need to think about those comorbidities, and I've done quite well in terms of looking after myself, but blood pressure has been an issue. And so um, I started on uh, Ramapil last year, but unfortunately I had side effects from that. Uh, and so I switched then to, to Losartan this year, which is now working very well, thank you. And so um, I'm taking three pills once a day. Um, I feel fantastic. I have a great full life um, and I expect quite a lot more life yet, which is a very different situation to how it was in 91 when I was diagnosed. Um, and so really for me now moving forwards, it's a matter of thinking not about the quantity of my life, which is what I had to think about when I was diagnosed, but what the quality of my life will be moving forwards um, and how medication and the advances that, that may arise in result of new medications might contribute to some of those um, improvements in my quality of life. And so I'll stop there and have the conversation with Paul that will then cover some of those uh, issues in more detail. Thank you.